Good evening, New Life Baptist Church. Uh, if you look at Hosea chapter 9 and verse number 9 there, it begins by saying they have deeply corrupted themselves. The title for the sermon this evening is they have deeply corrupted themselves. And just a reminder, once again, Hosea is being used by God to preach to this northern kingdom. And uh, the, the great judgment to come was the, the judgment was the captivity by the Assyrians. The fact that the people would be scattered throughout all the nations and um, and God speaks about this nation having deeply corrupted themselves. We'll get to what that means in a moment. But let's start there in verse number 1, which begins by saying, Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy as other people, for thou hast gone a whoring from thy God, thou hast loved a reward upon every corn floor. The reference of the corn floor there is, the, is where, where, would they, where uh, sorry, they would harvest um, grain, the wheat, you know, and so it's talking about their productivity on the land there. Verse number two, the floor and the wine press uh, shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. So the new wine is freshly squeezed grape juice that the wine press is used for. Verse number three, they shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. So you notice that uh, Egypt is mentioned, uh, Assyria is mentioned, and again, they were to be taken into captivity by the Assyrians, but not only that, the people of the land were scattered throughout different nations, and one of those nations would be uh, Egypt, where some people would try to flee the Assyrians by fleeing into Egypt. And so it's, it's quite interesting that they're going to return back to the same place that God had delivered them from all the way back, you know, for the story of the Exodus. And, you know, part of that judgment is they're going to go back to the land that they were in, as well as, you know, facing all these other traumatic events, uh, you know, being murdered and, and slaughtered by the Assyrians, taken into captivity, all these, all these things. And what you want to notice there in verse number two, it says, The floor and the wine press shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. So God is telling Israel, look, you, you, you were a land of prosperity. You had, you know, all the, the harvest, you had uh, the grains, you were able to uh, eat food, and not only that, you get the benefits of freshly squeezed wine, you know, freshly squeezed grape juice, right? And so there's a lot of luxuries on the land, there's great blessings, great productivity, and they're going to lose it all in this judgment of God. You see, sometimes God can judge a nation, and part of that judgment is removing all of its prosperity, all, all the blessings that you find on the land. You know, just uh, yesterday we celebrated, well, you know, well, our nation celebrated Australia Day, all right? And Australia is still seen as a nation of great prosperity, and I, I believe it is. It's a nation of great wealth, a, great, a nation of great blessings, and I still believe it is. We still, you know, e even in the face of all the restrictions, we still have a lot of freedom compared to a lot of the world. And, and so, you know, I, I, I know that, you know, we, we can sometimes, as Australians, just become accustomed to the great uh, peace, the great blessings that we can have on this land. And one of the problems is, when, when as a nation, when you're, when you're too blessed, when, when you have just too much in the land, you can get to the point where you forget God. And of course that happened to the Israelites here. They were so blessed on the land, they'll focus on the grains, they'll focus on the freshly squeezed grape juice, they'll focus on their productivity, but they had focused, they, sorry, they had forgotten to put their focus on God. You see, the only way you can be prosperous and the only way you can benefit his life is if you have your eyes on God, you know, you thank him for the blessings that you have in life, but when you forget God, don't be surprised when God steps in and removes all those prosperity that, they, you, know, that you may have had. And, and you see here, Israel is suffering from the judgment of God. And who knows, brethren, there might come a day where as Australians, we lose all the benefits that God has blessed us on this land. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me because our nation has forgotten God. Our nation forgets God, and you, you'll soon see how, you know, God responds from people forgetting Him. They've forgotten Him, they don't think about Him, they don't bless Him, they don't love Him. In fact, you'll soon see that the people of the land hated God, and you're going to see how God responds to that hatred. And, uh, you know, just a quick verse there in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, I'll just read it to you. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So set your affections, your love, your care, your thoughts on the things that are above. Heaven, on Christ, sitting on the right hand of the Father. Think about the rewards. Think about the eternal state that we can be with God forever. You set your affection on those things, you won't be let down. You set your affections on the things of this earth, you're going to be let down. You know, those things may very well be removed 
from you. So it's very clear that our mindset ought to be on spiritual things. In fact, you know, without repeating last week's sermon, I had mentioned how, the, or, or, I don't think it was last week, but last fortnight's sermon was, you know, you've got to sow to the things of God, to the spiritual things, and not sow to the flesh. Not sow to this world, not sow to this sinful world because you're going to reap corruption. No, we want to reap you know, the eternal matters, the eternal things that matter in heaven. Look, look at verse number 4 there, he, uh, Hosea 9 verse 4. They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, neither shall they be pleasing unto him. Their sacrifices shall be unto them as the bread of mourners. All that eat thereof shall be polluted. For their bread, for their soul, shall not come into the house of the Lord. What will you do in the solemn day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? And so the Lord's basically saying here is that they're not going to have the opportunity, you know, once God's judgment falls, they're not going to have the opportunity to go and offer their sacrifices, to, to offer their worship and praise in the house of God. It's not going to happen. Not only is the prosperity of the nation going to be removed, they're not going to be able to come before the Lord in the house of the Lord. Now, what this teaches us is that the house of the Lord, of course, the house of the Lord in the New Testament is your local church. And this teaches us is that we can, uh, you know, uh, take for granted the house of God. We can take for granted, you know, New Life Baptist Church, where we think, well, it's always going to be there. You know, we always have services three times a week. And we get used to that idea. You know, we get used to just, you know, God's, the house of God is always there. And when you take things for granted, you know, you, you'll be surprised at, at, you know, how much or how important the church is when you can't be there, you know. And we got a, a taste of that. We got a little bit of an experience of that, you know, earlier last year where there were, there were the lockdowns. I think it was March, April, something along those lines. We had like six weeks of lockdown up there in Queensland where we couldn't go to church, you know. And... Uh, the feedback that I got from many of you is how much you missed church, and I missed church significantly during that time, even though I was preaching sermons still. You know, the fact that we couldn't get together for the house of the Lord was a big deal. And, you know, when, when, when something is removed from you, you realize just how valuable it is. And so, you know, I think it's a blessing that the Lord allowed us to go through that period of, of a few weeks where we've not been able to meet in the house of the Lord. Because maybe we were taking it for granted. Maybe we were just expecting church to continue every single week. And we found out that we couldn't go to church. Boy, that's a big part of our life that we were missing, right? There was a big uh, burden there, you know, a bit of grief that we can't be in the house of the Lord. Well, what about when the house of the Lord is removed permanently, okay? And so for the residents of Israel here, their access to the house of the Lord was going to be lost completely. All right? So, you know, church attendance is a blessing. You need to understand that God's curse or God's judgment upon the Israelites here is to remove their ability to meet in the house of the Lord. All right? And the reason I say this is because, you know, if you take church for granted and you have that expectation that it's always going to be there, it can lead you to become apathetic, you know, about church. And when you become apathetic about church, you know, that's when you start to skip services. That's when you start to skip church. And you're like, well, I'm not going to go this week. What's the point? You know, I'll go next week. And then it'll become, well, I won't go this fortnight. You know, I'll go next month. And, uh, you know, I haven't gone to church for three months. I don't know. I won't go till next year. Right? And before you know it, you're out of church because you've become apathetic toward it. You've taken it for granted. And here's the thing. God's judgment is to remove access from the house of God. And so when you are purposely, you know, I'm not saying you have a legitimate reason to miss church, but when you are purposely missing church, you don't want to be there. You are basically asking God, God, I want that judgment from you. I want you to judge me and I want you to remove my access from the house of God. I want you to remove my access to church. And people put this upon themselves. They don't go to church and then they realize how much or how important it was in their lives but sometimes the pride gets in the way and they don't want to show their face in church anymore, right? Because they've been gone for so long. And so we need to take this, think about this, you know, take the experience that we had last year. And I don't know, maybe in 2021, there's going to be other times where lockdowns occur and we won't be able to meet in the house of the Lord. I hope not. But I hope, you know, the fact that you can be in church tonight, you can be in church every week, that you don't take that for granted. You realize God is blessing us. And if I were to remove myself from the house of God on purpose, hey, I'm just basically asking God to judge me and to, you know, curse me from not being able to be together with my church family. So church is important. 
God took away their ability to worship in the house of God. That was part of God's judgment. Verse number 6. For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. Memphis shall bury them. The pleasant places for their silver, nettles shall possess them. Thorns shall be in their tabernacles. And so it's saying here that Egypt shall gather them up. So as I said, some people are going to flee the captivity and they're going to be scattered in places like Egypt. Well, they think they're going to find safety there. But then it says Memphis, which Memphis is a city in Egypt. Memphis shall bury them. So they think they're escaping to Egypt, but they're going to die in Egypt. Okay? There's no, there's no way they can escape the judgment of God uh, when the Assyrians come. And even their silver, even their things of value, that's going to be taken away from them. Okay? By the, by the Egyptians. They're going to lose all their wealth in the hands, by the hands of the Egyptians. And verse number 7. The days of visitation are come. So the days of the judgment are come. The days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad. For the multitude of thine iniquity and the great hatred. Alright. Now when we read verse number 7, we read there that the prophet is a fool, the spiritual man is mad. That's not the actual case, okay? This prophet here that's been referred to is a true prophet of God. The spiritual man being referenced here is a true spiritual godly man, like living after the things of the Lord. But Israel, you know, the ungodly, the, un the wicked, the ungodly people, when they look at a true prophet of God, they think of them as a foolish person. When they look at a spiritual man, a spiritual family, people trying to live after the things of God, they think he's gone mad. And by mad, by crazy. They think that he's gone insane. He's lost his sanity. All right? And what it's saying here is the reason they believe that prophets, uh, you know, the prophets are foolish and that spiritual people are insane, it says there, because, for, because the multitude of thine iniquity, so they're full of sin themselves, and the great hatred, okay? So these people, or the, these Israelites, had gone to a point of great hatred toward the prophets, toward those that are truly preaching God's word, and toward those that are trying to live spiritual lives. All right, so the people, even though these people are supposed to be the people of God, they're so far removed from God, they're worshiping false gods, they hate the prophet, they hate the preacher, okay? They hate the things of God. And this is what I need you to um, remember as we keep reading through this chapter, because you'll soon see later that God hates them in return. Say, so can God hate? Absolutely, okay? Oh, you must mean God hates their sin. No, God hates them. Okay? And it's not just that God decided to hate them for no reason. They hated, they had a great hatred first for the things of God. All right? You know, we ought to love the prophets of God. We ought to love the preachers that come to preach us the truth of God's word. Hey, if someone's trying to live a spiritual life, hey, and they might put your life to shame a little bit because they're walking after God and they're doing the things that God wants from them in their lives and you're kind of, oh man, it shouldn't be like that. You should rejoice when people are living after God's ways. As God's people, as saved people, we ought to love the preachers. We ought to love the spiritual man. We ought to love our brothers and sisters in the Lord as we together try to live after God's ways. All right? But the people of the land, they had a great hatred for them. All right? So let's keep going there. And, uh, oh, by the way, before I keep reading, sorry, I'm just going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 1.18. 1 Corinthians 1.18, and I want you to remember this, especially for those of you that go soul winning, that go door to door soul winning. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So we know that the preaching of the cross, this is the power of God. This is what led us to salvation. This is how we can get other people saved. But for the wicked, for those that hate God, the preaching of the cross is foolishness. I want you to remember that, okay? So, you know, not only did this happen to Hosea as a prophet of God, people thought of him as foolish. People are going to think of you and I as foolish as well. People are going to think of you and I as insane as well when we get out there and preach the gospel. You know, I had a phone call this week of a woman who claims to be a Christian and she was angry that we had people going door-to-door -door and preaching the gospel, okay? 
And you know, this just shows you that you know, even so-called Christians can hate believers that try to live a spiritual life, that try to preach the, the cross of Jesus Christ, that try to get people saved, show them what they must do to be saved. Even so-called Christians can have a great hatred to those that just want to serve and love the Lord. Hey, but you know what? When people hate you, when people persecute you, praise God. Okay? It's just more rewards in heaven for us. Again, we have our mindset on the things above, not the things of this earth. Look at verse number 8. It says, The watchman of Ephraim was with my God. Now, I'm not sure if Hosea is speaking of himself, you know, referring to himself as a watchman of Ephraim, or he's just referring, it doesn't really matter, but, you know, if he's referring to other great preachers, other great prophets that the people of the land are hating, he says, look, we are watchmen of Ephraim, we are watching over Israel, and w was with my God, and, you know, the, the preacher ought to be with God as well. The preacher ought to be having a close walk and fellowship with the Lord. Keep that in mind, because we are watchmen of Australia. You know, God has set us up as watchmen to, to you know, to uh, proclaim, you know, the dangers that are ahead, to, pro to proclaim the judgment of God, to let people know that God's, uh, one, that one day they're going to die, and if they don't believe on Christ, that God is going to cast them in hell. And so God has set us up to be watchmen as well. But not only should we be watchmen, but we should be with God. We should have a close walk with God. It's so vital for God to use you effectively in the preaching of His Word. But notice what it keeps, uh, verse, it says in verse number 8, it keeps going there. It says, but the prophet, now I'll just stop there for a moment, this prophet is not a prophet of God, okay? Don't compare this prophet with the prophet that we read in verse number 7. Because it says here, but the prophet, now this is a false prophet, is a snare of the fowler in all his ways. The fowler is somebody that you know, a fowler is a bird. So a fowler is someone that hunts after birds. All right. So the false prophet is being referred to as someone who hunts. All right. And then it says, oh, and sorry, and he's a snare of the fowler. He also traps. He traps. He he has uh, you know ways of capturing people. And then it says this, and hatred in the house of his God. All right. So the false prophet causes people in the house of his God to hate God. All right? The false prophet causes people to hate God. He preaches falsely. He entraps the people. He deceives the people. And before you know it, those same people hate the God of the Bible. Or they just create a God of their own imagination, some other God, some other idea. Oh, God's just love. God never hates. They have a false idea of God because they've been deceived by a false prophet. They've been trapped by the teaching of a false prophet. This is why it's so important for us to preach the Bible cover to cover, every chapter, every verse, so we know the true God of the Bible. Okay? And this is where the hatred is coming from. This is where the hatred toward God is coming from. Now you can understand a little bit more why God will hate them in return. You know, and, and the reason I know this is about a false prophet here is because in 2 Timothy 3.6, Speaking about false prophets, it says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. So the false prophet is known as somebody that is trying to lead people into captivity. They're trying to trap them. All right? They're not trying to free them with knowledge. They're not trying to guide them in the word of God. They're trying to trap them. Okay? And they're very effective at trapping, you know, ladies, women. Women have a, have a, are easy to be deceived by the false prophet. That's why it's so important for them to, you know, listen to their fathers and to their husbands that are godly men or go and get into themselves into a good church that preaches the truth so they're not deceived by these false people. But, you know, you can see once again that the hatred toward God or toward the things of God are a result of people listening to the false prophets. Okay? Instead of listening to the watchmen, those that are truly walking with God, those that are truly close to God. Look at verse number 9. And this is where we get a title for the sermon. It says, They have deeply corrupted themselves. Now let's stop there for a moment. If you're talking about corruption, is that a negative connotation there? Right? Uh, something is corrupt. But what about if it's deeply corrupted? I mean, that's just... That's even worse than corruption, right? I mean, that's just, that's like the extre an extreme corruption, right? 
It says here, they have deeply corrupted themselves. People can corrupt themselves. You say, what kind of corruption are we talking about here, Pastor? Well, let's keep going. It says there, as in, or like in, the days of Gibeah, therefore he will remember their iniquity, he will visit their sins. Okay? So the corruption that's taking place in Israel today is like the corruption that took place in the days of Gibeah. Okay, you say, what is that? We'll look at that soon. And because of that, God is going to remember their iniquities. God will visit or judge them in their sins. Now, keep your finger there and let's go to Judges chapter 19. Judges chapter 19, because we're going to the story that took place in Gibeah, which is being referred to here by Hosea. Okay, Judges chapter 19 and verse number 1. And as I'm going through this, it will become very obvious what this deep corruption is. All right. Judges chapter 19 and verse number 1, the Bible reads, And it came to pass in those days, when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim, who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Now, so we, we start this story of this, this man who takes a concubine to himself, this Levite, and, uh, you know, she's from Bethlehem, Judah, Bethlehem, right? Now, let's drop down to verse number 15. Because I haven't got time to go through the whole story here. Though. I mean, in your own time, you can read the whole chapter if you want. Let's just hit the main points. Verse number 15. And they turned aside thither. That's the man and his wife, or the concubine. To go in and to lodge in Gibeah. So, they're traveling. And they, they decide, hey, we've got into the city of Gibeah. Let's lodge here. Let's rest here. The day's getting late. Let's stop here for the night. It says here, and when he went in... He sat him down in a street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house to lodge in. So he's trying to find a place to stay. He can't find any place to stay. So he decides, well, we're just going to hang out here on the street. We're just going to spend the night on the street. Okay? Seems fine. Doesn't seem like there's any problems there. Let's keep going to some 16. And behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at even, which was also of Mount Ephraim, so he sojourned in Gibeah, but the men of the place were Benjaminites. Okay? And when he had lifted up his eyes, so this old man lifts up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the street of the city, and the old man said, Whither goest thou, and whence comest thou? So this old man sees this couple on the street. They're going to spend the night there on the street, and he has a concern for them. You know, what are you doing here? Where are you going? All right? Let's drop down to verse number 20. It says, And the old man said, Peace be with thee, howsoever let all thy wants lie upon me, only lodge not in the streets. This old man says, Look, just stay with me. You know, anything you need, I'll take care of it. But look, just don't stay in the streets. He had a major concern for this couple. Don't stay in the streets. Come and stay with me. Okay, so there was something this old man knew that this young couple did not know. All right, and what took place? Well, if you, if you look at verse, verse number 21, so he brought him into his house and gave provender unto the asses, and they washed their feet and did eat and drink. So this old man's taking care of him, not only of him, but also of his uh, donkey there, or donkeys that they had there. Now, as they were making their hearts merry, Behold the men of the city. So the men of Gibeah. Okay? The men of the city. Now, who are these men? It says here, certain sons of Belial. Certain sons of Belial. What is Belial? If you don't know, it's the devil. It's another name of the devil. Hey, these people that are coming to this old man's door, uh, I'm not talking about the couple here, I'm talking about others uh, of the city. The men of Gibeah, they are children of the devil. You say, that's pretty extreme. Yeah, that's pretty extreme, okay? Listen, we're children of God. We've been born again of the Spirit, okay? Thank God that He is our Heavenly Father. Well, you know what? There are certain people that also have a spiritual father, and they're children of the devil. The devil is their father. These are reprobates. These are haters of God. These are people that have rejected God, and because they've hated and rejected God, well, God has rejected them, and God hates them as well. So now you can understand why this is being taught by Hosea, because you see the people of the land, they hated God as well. Okay? And so God is, is likening them or saying, look, you've done the same things 
as what took place in Gibeah. You say, what took place? Well, let's keep going. It says there, uh, verse number 22, uh, Certain sons of Belial beset the house roundabout and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. Hey, these children of the devil told the old man, Hey, bring out the man, not the, not the wife, not the concubine, Bring out the man that we may know him. Okay? Now, when the Bible says here to know him, this is not speaking that they wanted to become, they, they want to know, they, they want to introduce themselves to the man. Okay? They want to know who this man is. No. To know, you know, this is a, a, a phrase that is sometimes used in the Bible to speak of physical, you know, sexual intercourse. All right? And, you know, it's kind of like when, when Adam. Now, the Bible says that Adam knew Eve, his wife, okay? And then she conceived and therefore, uh, you know, br brought forth Cain, okay? Adam knew his wife, all right? This is a, the proper place between that is between a man and a wife in marriage, okay? These are men of the city that want to sexually abuse this other man. Who are the children of the devil here? These are homosexuals. These are sodomites. These are those that have deeply corrupted themselves. These are filthy, corrupted human beings that hate God, that reject God. Listen, God has rejected them. God hates them. Okay? And this is the story. This is what God is comparing the people of Israel to, to have done. As the story here in Gibeah. Okay? Let's keep going. Verse number 23. And the man, the master of the house went out unto them, that's the old man, and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is come into mine house, do not this folly. Look, and, and so he says, look, this is folly, this is, this is filthy, this is disgusting. You know, you wanting a man for yourself? So what does he do? The old man makes a different offer, he makes a trade, all right? Now, what the old man has done is not right, all right? What he offers is not right. But let's have a look at what he offers. He says, verse number 24, Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them will I bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what, see if, what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. You know what homosexuality is, brethren? It's vile. It's disgusting. It's filthy. Okay, I don't even like to even preach about it because I don't want to think about how vile and filthy, disgusting homosexuality is. This old man says, look, don't do a vile thing. Okay, don't you commit homosexuality toward this man. And so what does he do? Hey, he, he also does wrong, the old man. He offers his daughter and he offers the concubine of the man, hoping that that's going to appease the homosexuals, hoping that it's going to appease the children of the devil. Let's keep going. Verse number 25. But the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. And they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house, and her hands were, were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up, and let us be going. But none answered. Then the man took her up upon an ass, and the man rose up and got him into his place. And so what happened, brethren, is that this, this man, this Levite, offered his concubine to the homosexuals and they took her they knew her they abused her all night long okay she's able to find her way back to the house in the morning but then she passes away she doesn't respond she, she, she's, she's passed on she's dead okay they've abused her to death these homosexuals okay these vile disgusting predators you say, well, he should never have done that. You're right. He should have never done that. You say, the old man should have never offered his daughter. You're right. The old man should have never offered his daughter. But you know what is going through the heads of the old man? 
He's saying, look, it's better. Look, it, you know, often my daughter is wicked, but it's, it's not as bad as a man taking another man and committing homosexual, homosexuality. Okay, homosexuality in the Bible is worse than a woman being taken and raped. Okay, now that's horrible as well. I'm not saying that's fine. I'm not saying what these men did is right. What they did was wrong. Okay, but in their minds, they're thinking that homosexuality, sodomy is even worse. So instead of doing such a wicked sin, let's just offer these women that we have here. And, you know, you saw what happened. They ended up abusing this woman to death. Let's keep going in the story, verse number 29. And when he was come into his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into 12 pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. So this man as a, you know, takes his concubine, cuts her up. I mean, this is, this is a bad story, right? But he sends it as a testament as to what happened uh, at, you know, in the city. Look at verse number 30. And it was so that all that saw it said, there was no such deed done nor ever, nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt until unto this day. Consider of it, take advice, and speak your minds. So this man sends out these bodily pieces of his concubine to show them just how, what these filthy perverts, these filthy sodomites had done to his concubine, to send a message. Hey, these people of this land are, are wicked. What are you going to do about it? All right? And you can see how they responded. They said, look, there's, there's never been such a deed. There's never been such wickedness take place in this land since we've come out of Egypt. All right? So look, homosexuality is, is, is by far one of the most wicked things that, that could possibly be done on the land. And we live in Australia, and now they can get married. Hey, they, can, they can have children. They can adopt children or whatever. You know, and, and, hey, when is God's judgment going to come upon this land? You know, it's coming. Maybe, maybe it's already started, brethren. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, they're haters of God. You know, don't be surprised if God judges our land because, listen, we're accepting of this lifestyle. We're accepting of these reprobates. We accept, well, when I say we, I'm talking about our nation has accepted them and, and they, you know, it's all about the gay rights right now. You know, it's all about giving the homosexuals what they want. Listen, these people are vile. They're disgusting, okay? They're haters of God and God hates them. Let's go back to uh, Judges, please. Uh, sorry, Hosea. Let's go back to Hosea, chapter number 9, and verse number 10. Hosea 9, verse number 10. It says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. So God is now referring to Israel. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in a fig tree at her first time. So God is saying, look, you know, in the early days, you know, yeah, your, your people, the, the, the Jews, the Israelites... Hey, they were like these, these nice ripe grapes, these nice ripe figs, you know. But what's happened since then? It says, but they went to Baal Peor and separate, Baal is another way of the devil, by the way, another name, and uh, separated themselves unto that shame, and their abominations were according as they loved. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird from the birth and from the womb and from the conception. And so God is saying, look, because this homosexuality is going on in your land, okay, I'm going to judge you. I'm going to judge you severely. And part of the judgment that's going to fall here on the land is that God's going to prevent them from, uh, God's going to judge them in childbirth. Okay, and we saw that there, that their glory shall fly away like a bird from the birth. So what that means is that there are going to be newborns at the birth that are going to pass away. You know, they might have genetic defects or something along those lines. Or, you know, there's mothers, because you'll soon see that, you know, uh, one of the judgments is dry breasts. And so potentially mothers are unable to feed their children. And so they die at childbirth. Uh, what else? It says from the birth and from the womb. And so another judgment is going to come that children are going to die in the wombs of the mother. So it's a miscarriage. And then it says, and from conception. And so God's going to prevent. You know, conception is when the man's seed fertilizes the egg. And then what happens that, you know, they, they refer it to as an embryo, it's necessary for it to attach itself to the uterine wall 
of the woman. That's straight off the conception. And so God's going to prevent that from taking place so that the embryo does not develop you know, into a full-grown baby. And so you see that God's judgment is going to fall upon them. They're not going to be able to be fruitful in childbearing. Okay? Now that's important for you to think about because this is one method by which God judges you know, wickedness. How God judges wicked people. Verse number 12. Though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them that there shall not be a man left. Yea, woe also to them when I depart from them. So not only for those that are going to give, you know, that are falling pregnant and, and going to give birth, is the judgment going to fall upon them, but also for those that have older children, okay, they're also going to have a judgment upon them. It's as though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them. Now the word bereave means to be deprived of something, especially something close to you. So even though they brought forth children, they're going to uh, be deprived of their children's presence, right? So when the Assyrians come, again, there's going to be a lot of death, but also families are going to be ripped apart. Children are going to be ripped apart from their parents. So again, this is part of the judgment of God on this land. Verse number 13. Ephraim, as I saw Tyrus, is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. Give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. So you can see here now the prophet is in agreement with God. He says, yes, God. You know, I mean, you know, just the thought of, of, of this, this horrible judgment where they cannot bring forth children, okay, or, or miscarrying, or, you know, newly born babies dying for whatever reason. You know, it, it's, a, it's a horrible judgment. But you can see that Hosea has gotten on board with God's agenda. He's saying, yes, Lord, this is, this, is, this is what needs to take place because they're so evil. Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. And so, of course, miscarrying, they can't bring forth children. Dry breasts, meaning that they cannot feed their newborn babies. Now, can you please uh, keep your finger there and turn to Genesis chapter 20? Turn to Genesis chapter 20. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from Psalm 127, verse 3. Because I want to show you that having children, being falling pregnant and bringing forth children is actually a blessing from God. It's a reward from God. You know, every couple, you know, every married couple should desire to be blessed by God, to be rewarded by God and have children. In verse number three, it says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. It's our inheritance from God. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children in the youth. And so you see that children is a reward of God. I've got 11 kids. I've been rewarded 11 times. Praise God. Okay? Praise God for his rewards. It's a blessing. God wants married people to have children. It's a, it's a true blessing, brethren. It's hard work, yes, but it's so enjoyable. If you, if, you, if you apply the things that God says, if you raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, okay, then it will be a good time. It will be a blessing. If you don't raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, then it's going to be a lot of burdens on you. Okay? Yes, it all this requires work, but it's, you know, anything to be enjoyed requires effort, right? And having children does have, you know, requires you to put the effort in, but it's a great reward from God. You know, I'm going to read another psalm to you before we go to Genesis 20. It's Psalm 113, verse 9. It says, He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. And so ladies that might be struggling to fall pregnant, they may be barren. Well, God says, you know what? I'm going to give that barren woman the ability to keep house, to be a joyful mother of children. Listen, children bring joy. Okay? It gives happiness in the home. It brings that, that joy. And if you go to Genesis 20, now look at verse number 17. Genesis 20, verse number 17. Because given, you know, having children is a blessing. And you know what? If, if you are able to bear children, I strongly encourage you, continue. You know, you know, have as many children as God will give you. You know, continue just serving God in this area. You know, you know asking God to bless you, to reward you with children. Okay? But you can see that being barren or dry breasts is a judgment that, can, you know, that God can use. You know, and look, here's the thing. I, I, I recognize that some women are just are barren, okay? And some women are going to have a hard time breastfeeding, okay? And I'm not saying that every time that happens, that's, a judge, that's a, like this direct judgment by God. 
You know, the fact that it happens to some people is because we have genetic defects. You know, <laughs> I've said this before. You know, we're not what you know God's initial creation was with Adam and Eve. You know, we've gone several uh, centuries. We've gone thousands of years of human reproduction. And we've got the sin nature. So our bodies continue to deteriorate. And there's going to be hormonal issues that prevent women from, you know, falling pregnant or, or, or uh, you, know, um, you know, breastfeeding, things like this. Okay? But at the same time, this is an issue that God can judge a whole nation with or entire people with, if he so wishes. Because in Genesis 20, verse 17, this is about Abimelech and Abraham. And just very quickly, Abimelech had done wrong. And God's anger was upon King Abimelech. And so it happens here, it says in verse number 17, So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they that bear children. Why did God heal these people? Well, look at verse number 18. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So God's judgment had fallen upon Abimelech and his family, okay, and God, one of that judgment was that he closed up their wombs so they would not be blessed with the ability to bring forth children, okay? But when, Abra uh, when Abraham prays for him, then God removes that judgment and again allows, them to, allows the wombs to be opened up to bring forth children. Now, the reason I'm, I'm spending time with this, brethren, is because, once again, God can use this as a terrible judgment, Okay? God has said, hey, you are wicked, you've done wicked things, I'm going to judge you, and I'm going to close up your womb. Well, how many Australians are on birth control pills right now? How many Australians kill their own children in their own womb right now? Okay? And they think they're doing it for, you know, for their own profit. They think they're doing these things to, uh, so they can enjoy life or something like this. Once again, just like somebody that avoids church, which was, you know, removing church as a judgment of God, well, God, God, part of God's judgment is closing up the womb. And these women of Australia, okay, and I know this happens across this world, but this is the nation we live in, they've decided to close up their own wombs, they've decided to kill their own children, right? Which is basically saying to God, God, give me your judgment. God, I'm a wicked person, they're saying. Okay, they're saying, I'm so wicked, Lord, come and judge me, come and close up my womb. In fact, I'll, I'll help you along, Lord. I'll be the one that kills my children. I'll be the one that closes up my womb. And I'll be the one that takes all these pills that makes my body a hostile environment to bring forth children. So, listen, our world is upside down is what I'm saying to you, brethren. Our, 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 our people, Australians, are basically saying, God, judge us because we're wicked. In fact, we'll help you, God. We'll help you, and we'll, we'll judge ourselves because we are so wicked. Okay? And listen, our nation is, is absolutely wicked. All right? Now, I went to a website about birth control pills. I'll just read a, a passage to you. And look, this website is not against birth control. In fact, this website was for birth control, right? But this is what it says about the birth control pills. It says, when you take them, the estrogen and progesterone from the birth control pills also cause the uterine lining to become inhospitable for embryo implantation and causing the cervical mucus to be too hostile for an environment for sperm to swim toward the cervix. All right? The same website says that after you take birth control pills, it can take several weeks, several months, maybe even several years before you can fall pregnant once again because you've turned your body into a baby-killing machine. All right? Some people don't understand. They think that birth control pills stops them from falling pregnant. That's, that can happen, but most often that's not the case. Okay? Yes, it does make the, uh, what did it say, the cervical muc mucus hostile to the seed of the man. Okay? But if that seed still fertilizes the woman's egg, what it does is it prevents, and that's, like, that's conception by the way, it prevents that embryo from... Uh, attaching to the uterine lining, okay? It makes the, uh, what did it say again? It makes the, um, the lining uh, inhospitable for embryo implantation, okay? And so what it's doing is basically, you're falling pregnant, you're, you're having conception with these birth control pills, but then that baby's unable to attach to, uh, to the uterine wall, which, which is where it gets its nutrients and its growth from the mother. Okay? And so women across Australia are taking these pills 
and they're killing their own babies. Okay? They're making themselves barren, which God said this will be a judgment that falls upon him. Okay? That comes from him. Okay? This is something that falls upon the people of this land because they're haters of God. Okay? Can you see our nation? Our nation is full of homosexuality. You know, they go out in the streets and they march and they talk about their pride. And then we have mothers killing their children in the womb. Do you see how wicked our nation has become, brethren? It's, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. Okay? And, and, and they're not even waiting for God's judgment. They're just, they're just judging themselves. They're, they're, you know, it's, it's crazy. And they think this is wonderful. They think it's fine. They think this is great. Let's keep going. Verse number 15. Hosea chapter 9, verse number 15. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. Notice now, what is God saying? He says, for there I hated them. You say, Pastor Kevin, no, no, no. God hates their sins. You know, we're supposed to hate the sin, but love the sinner. Wrong. Okay? When these people get into these horrible sins, brethren, these homosexuals, we're not to love them. Okay, it doesn't say, you know, hate homosexuality, but love the homosexual. No, God hates the homosexual. Okay? God, he says, for there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine house. And then he says this, I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Hey, they're revolting. Okay? I will love them no more. Just in case you don't understand what it means to hate, for God to hate these people, he says, look, I don't love them anymore. I'm not going to love them anymore. Meaning, there was a time when God did love them. There was a time when he was offering his salvation to them, where he was being merciful and long-suffering to them. But they hated God. They hated the things of God. They rejected God. So God says, you know what? If you want to be that way, I'm going to hate you too. All right? And I'm not going to love you anymore. They're rejected by God. Listen, don't tell me to love the homosexual. If God hates them, then I'm going to hate them as well. Okay? Not all hate is wrong. If you hate the things that God hates, amen, praise God, you're doing righteously. If you love the things that God loves, amen, you're doing righteously. Love the things that God loves. Hate the things that God hates. And you'll be right with God. You'll be that spiritual man. Okay? And as I said, people are going to hear my preaching and they're going to go, Pastor Kevin's gone insane. Well, that's what they said about Hosea. That's what they said about those that are serving God. So don't let it be a surprise when people start saying that your pastor is a crazy man. Okay? He's gone mad. He's gone insane. No, brethren. We're just standing true to the word of God. It's our nation that's gone insane. Okay? It's our nation that is backwards. And you know what? Just let me quickly bring up what's happened this past Sunday at First Works Baptist Church and how these homosexuals have come in and they've, you know, uh, graffiti, they vandalized the church building, they've thrown in some explosive device into the church building, blown out the windows, okay? Why are they doing that? You know, when, when all, all God's men are doing, all, all Pastor Bruce here is doing is preaching God's word. All he's doing is preaching the truth of God's word, okay? That's all he's doing. And what do these people do? They come in and they want to hurt the church, right? Why? Because they hate God. Okay? Because they rejected God. Because they listen to false prophets who will reprobate themselves. They're God haters. And it is right for us to hate God haters. All right? And by the way, let me just say, I support Pastor Bruce Mejia. You know, we support First Works Baptist Church. And after this sermon, when you guys get together for prayer, please be praying for that church. You know, bring them to the Lord because they need our prayers. Verse number 16. Ephraim is smitten. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Yea, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. My God will cast them away because they did not hearken unto him. And they shall be wanderers among the nations. Listen, God cast away these people that hated him. You know what? No homosexuals are allowed at New Life Baptist Church. No homosexuals are allowed at Blessed Hope Baptist Church. If they try to come in here, we're going to cast them away. They're not allowed here. Okay? If God is, is willing to cast them out, I'm, I'm going to follow suit. I'm going to do what God says. 
Okay? We're not going to be disobedient to God's commands. There are no homosexuals allowed in our church. All right? Now, we'll end on this. I'm just going to end with Matthew 5.13. Because, once again, this nation was a people of God, supposedly. They were meant to be. They were meant to be God's holy nation. And God has cast them away. There is a warning for believers about being cast away. And I've preached on this before, but we'll just finish on this and we'll touch upon this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus says about his believers, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Okay? And so we need to be careful. You know, let's take heed. Let's not become angry at God. Let's be people that don't take for granted his house, you know, where we can come and offer our sacrifice and worship. You know, let's not take that for granted. Let's not be a people that just think it's fine to, to be a homosexual. It's just fine to commit abortions. Let's be not those kinds of people, brethren, because we don't want to lose our saltiness. We don't want to lose our savor. Listen, if we lose that, if we lose that zeal, that passion, that love for the things of God, then we're going to be salt that's good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. So let this be a warning to us. You know what? These homosexuals, they are deeply corrupted. They've deeply corrupted themselves. It's a wicked lifestyle. And you know what? They're not permitted in our church, and we ought to hate them the way God hates them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for your word. Thank you for Hosea chapter 9, for the truth of your word. Uh, God, even though these things are not popular in this day and age, uh, Lord, and uh, people would you know, easily use this sermon against me and against our church. But Lord, I ask that you would protect us. Lord, I, I ask you that you would uh, you know, um, just be with us, Lord. We want to be your preachers. We want to preach your truth, Lord, in your house. But also, Lord, as we go door to door and, and preach the great news of the gospel, I pray you'd protect us from the evil one. Lord, I pray you protect us from the reprobates as well. And Lord, that we would always stand true, that we would never allow these wicked, vile perverts, these hate, haters of God to enter into our church. Lord, I thank you so much for the warnings that you have in the Bible. And Lord, I pray that we would be salt that never loses its savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, church.